Thank you all for being here today. Um, we'd like to welcome um, Melanie and Charlie to who are here to talk about their their new books. Um, and we're recording. So if everyone could please make sure your microphones are muted, um, we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction and then um, Melanie and Charlie are going to go ahead and talk about their, their books a little bit and um, go ahead and get a dialogue started and then we'll follow up with some questions. Um, so Melanie is a Philadelphia based writer um, and she, she does science fiction, um, dread and queer um, and when not working on projects or at her day job in, as an advertising copywriter she enjoys cooking exploring Philly's food scene talking about horror films on her podcast splatter chatter golfing and doing work as marketing and outreach coordinator at the 215 at the 215 festival yeah. All right, and Charlie, um, Charlie, I thought I had your bio in front of me, um, so I apologize. I have oh, it's no problem. <laughs> description here, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so Charlie is a writer from Columbus, Ohio. Um, he is a professional comic book, comic book shop lurker and tenured black dude in America. Um, please satisfy your unnatural obsession with him via Twitter. Um, that's the bio that I have for you here. Thanks, appreciate it. <laughs> I'll, let you, uh, I'll let you elaborate on those introductions and um, yeah, look forward to hearing more from you. Awesome. And thank you, Laura, for uh, introducing and thanks for hosting uh, Melody and I for this conversation. Um, so I guess I wanted to just start with uh, first congratulations, Melanie, on your newest novel, uh, The Original Glitch, which is right here, which the writing is backwards because I forgot how cameras work. But yeah, no, I uh, absolutely loved your novel and I'm excited to talk more about it with you. I'm just going to read a brief uh synopsis on it just to kind of catch people up who uh, may not be familiar and in the aftermath of his mentor's death grad student Adler is left to piece together and clean up the project she left behind an adaptive and increasingly malevolent artificial intelligence kept locked in a virtual box that's no longer quite enough to keep him in check as he tries to manage the AI and continue Dr. Kent's research Adler soon discovers her sociopathic creation is determined to escape his enclosure to wreak havoc on the outside world. So, you know, just a fun beach read. <laughs> but, For some but, people. <laughs> yeah, true, true, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I absolutely love the characters. The uh, dialogue uh, most definitely was one of my favorite pieces. I, I very much felt the realism and uh, the reactions of the character to many of the, the twists that occurred. Um, when it comes to your novel, uh, would you be open to reading us a passage at all to start sure. things off? Yeah, awesome. I got a, got a hopefully quick passage here. Oh, yeah. It's always one of those things where you're like, no, I want to give them a little bit more. But uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got one here that's uh, from a bit earlier in the book. Um, and I'll just go right into it. Adler often thought going to grad school might have been a mistake. He knew that logically it wasn't true. He was learning things he'd never let under, he's, he was learning things they'd never let undergraduates get near, experiencing things he never would if he was back at his mom's townhouse in Scranton. But in the small moments where he was not up against deadlines for papers or lectures, he felt the weight of staying still. Palmer College was not a place that advertised its presence. It was the kind of place that was found when it wanted to be. He didn't want to know the full story behind its fat endowments, how the Baron Consortium had come to funnel so much money over so much time into its labs, 
like sausage making, better not to know the secrets. An exaggeration maybe, but not by much. Still, not knowing the details had this way of making him feel like a child. He was almost 27 and hadn't lived in his mother's house for years, but he was still in school, still woke up every morning in an apartment the school provided. It was one that they wouldn't let him burn candles in or incense or even own a pet. It felt like a practice life. Wilson would tell him that was exactly why they kept coming back to it. The safety was addictive. He was only able to banish these thoughts when night fell and he, he was staring at the glow of his computer screen, typing rapidly at whatever asinine project kept him awake and then puzzling at the inevitable bug with an overworked Google tab. Tonight, an app, tonight, an app long requested by the student body, student body for monitoring transit times on the campus shuttles. Who one of you even thinks about shouting, I'm in during this class, I'm, your ass is going to the library for a week to think about what you did, a middle school teacher had once said the first time he stepped into a coding class. We're writing an instruction manual for building, we're writing an instruction manual for building from tree to chair, not hacking into the FBI. Adler had eventually built a dice rolling simulator. Right now, everyone on campus was relying on a crowdsourced social media hashtag, hashtag whips. Where is Palmer Shuttle? They'd stolen the tag for their project, the whips app. Adler switched on the music to fill in the quiet. It blared in his ears, song after song, blending into each other as if he were blacking out through sections of code and waking up hours later. But if he took the headphones off, He'd be left with no sound except the thwacking of keys and the jittering of his own leg bouncing the contents of his desk. He was going to need to write. He was going to need to write another test. He scribbled that down in a notebook, simply labeled "bugs." Code bug. Think test. Move on. Repeat ad nauseum. He'd almost won a Kaggle competition two years ago on an object detection in images for AI. The prize was twenty-five thousand dollars. He didn't win, but his mentor, Dr. Kent, was impressed. Told him he was the only one, as far as she could see, who had tried to account for the differing levels of zoom in the images of human faces in the test set with generative adversarial networks. His girlfriend, Charlie, was less impressed, at least when he rattled it, rattled it off as, a, as clinically as that. I was accounting for bias in a training test, he tried, to, he tried again. But she was going to be a librarian. Someone did all her coding for her. When he told her that it was possible to trick computer vision with overtraining, she had too many questions and he got frustrated. She told him then that he liked talking, not educating. He turned red and did not disagree. Despite that, he knew she had a vision for how their worlds would fit together. One day they'd live and work together in some dinky library at the edge of the world where she would be in charge of books and he'd be there to fix the website and design the graphics or marketing or some shit. And they'd live in a townhouse and have a boy and a girl and he'd go bald and she'd drive a minivan. Thinking of a version of himself that was a suburban dad working on web design with a beer belly and a patch of bald skin on top of his scalp made his skin itched. Miss Call, Charlie, who stamped across the front of his phone with a lovely three next to it and several texts waiting to be read just underneath. He couldn't blame her, but he hadn't promised they'd go to dinner. She'd said, he'd said she'd let her know if he ended up being free, if. Then again, he hated it when people didn't answer their phone. Wilson often left his phone on silent, face down, because the possibility of communication gave him anxiety. He never answered on the first try, unless you were extremely lucky in your timing. So Adler could only imagine Charlie's frustration when he kept, when he kept pounding away at the keyboard, watching worlds come to life on the computer screen instead of even looking to see if her calls were for an emergency. They weren't. They might be, but they weren't. Speaking of Wilson, hi, Adler said as soon as Wilson accepted the call. You're getting clingy. I just love hearing your voice. The tone was joking at the same, the tone was joking. At the same time, Wilson, Adler's only friend, or at least the only one he'd really been able to talk to since Dr. Kent died. Wilson was the only person who made that story as simple as it was. She killed herself, man. I'm sorry. I'm working on some stuff for the dumb transit app, Adler said. Thinking about taking a break though, work on some stuff in the box. Doesn't sound like a break. We need some liquid for the automated messages in the terminal sends. It's been auto-populating the wrong dates, which isn't all that terrible, but Horn is paranoid. I think it's a lack of sleep. Oh good, you did in fact call to talk about work. At least this is the go to jail if you tell anyone work, Adler reminded him. 
Oh yeah, a top secret canvas transit app. No, I mean the box, idiot. I figured you'd be a little bit more interested in that than Call of Duty. I like killing terrorists. More than hearing me be self-deprecating, you do know I love to listen to you bruise your own ego. There was a shuffle on the line as Wilson resituated himself. He was getting ready for a long talk, Adler imagined, with the phone smashed between his ear and shoulder because it was too late at night for the speakerphone and his boyfriend Cam was asleep. I just like, the shit is really complicated, Adler leaned back, lifting his fingers off the keys for the first time in hours, and I need someone to rant to. To find out about the rant, you'll have to read more. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I couldn't read <laughs> myself. <laughs> was, no, thank you so much for the for reading. Um, so with that wonderful introduction, and for one, I just got to say thank you for choosing an excerpt that has Wilson, because Wilson was a uh, boss in the book. Um, <laughs> and uh, starting with what was the inspiration for uh, the original glitch, as far as, um, I guess more specifically to uh, the interest that you have in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, what, what made you decide to use this as kind of uh, the, the backdrop of uh, of your novel? Um, it actually came about um, while I was working as a ghostwriter for like Truly Pennies um, for a online, um, like an ebook publisher. And they would do like these little, like very small, like 10,000 word, um, like ebooks on different topics. And uh, one of them was artificial intelligence. And, you know, I had to learn really quick about that sort of thing because it was, you know, my understanding of it was Terminator and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it got me really interested because I, I found this concept called AI boxes, which is kind of the big thing um, that's at the catalyst of the story, which could be anything, it, you know, like one really extreme example is like in Ex Machina, the house that they're in would be an example and that sort of thing. In this case, it's a little bit different. Um, and I, what I really liked about that, and I'm afraid to go too much into it um, and not divulge too much, but what I liked about that is, you know, how that sort of tied into um, the possibility of, you know, like simulation hypothesis, you know, how would you know um, if uh, you were in one um, and that sort of thing. And then uh, I spent several years working on that and I got a little smarter in my knowledge of artificial intelligence and that sort of thing, working with a podcast actually as a show nights writer where um, they were, it's a data science podcast. And, you know, every episode I have to listen to an hour of these people who are, you know, extremely intelligent, extremely experienced in this talk back and forth and basically had to learn by osmosis, um, which is why there's a lot of, um, <laughs> I drop a lot of technical stuff in there. I feel like just to show that I can. <laughs> And it's not always like I had a um, editor who was um, a uh, uh, like a technical consultant, and he gave me many notes about various things. Where he's like, you know, you don't have to to you, we get it, you know, <laughs> um, which was very helpful. But yeah, I mean, it was it was working on another project essentially and discovering uh, this whole this whole side of um, artificial intelligence and and that industry. Thank you so much. Sorry. So um, I apologize about the muting issue. I, I, uh, I'm i so used to like throwing my mute on when others are speaking that uh, I just was unable to unmute myself. So, um, but yeah, no, I definitely um, agree with the, the, the ex machina uh, reference, mm -hmm. especially because uh, I thought about that a lot when I was re when I was reading your book, um, just in the the idea of being um, encapsulated. Uh, I didn't. I never thought about that as far as like the 
when I watched that movie, uh, that that house itself was a a kind of construct of of a prison. Um, and just talking about that, it makes me think a lot about that concept of uh, artificial realities and how uh, each of the characters in your book kind of operate within their a prison in their own way, uh, which is interesting to me. Without giving too much away, I would say that uh, you can point to Theo and then you can see with Laura and Adler even in some uh, ways, though I would say Adler's is more of a, a more figurative uh, prison uh, of his own making and, uh, and perhaps his alcoholism's making too. But um, yeah, no, I, I definitely dug that. Uh, when it comes to the characters themselves, you did a lot of exploration with the relationship of parent and child uh, in some specific senses, as well as some more uh, like larger ways. Uh, I felt that Theo, for instance, was very childlike, uh, almost uh, even though you could argue more of like a bratty child in some ways. Um, with some of his antics and his views on everyone else. Um, when it came to, to doing like the relationship between Adler and Theo, Adler and Kent, uh, Kent and Theo, uh, and Wilson and his father, uh, what, I, I'm trying to think how I want to frame this, um, whose relationship was probably the hardest to, to kind of piece together for you when you were writing? I would say probably um, Theo and Dr. Kent's relationship, if just because a lot of, you know, who Theo was as a character evolved a lot um, over the, the course of writing. Um, you know, and it's, there was a lot of like sort of questions that came out of it of, of like, you know, how, you know, how would a, a parent feel resenting their child? How does it, or, you know, in this, their child in this case, how does a, you know, child feel resenting their parent? And I was looking into a lot of, um, I think it ended up actually the, re the exact reference ended up getting, getting cut in, in edits, but I was looking at a lot of, um, uh, I forget his first name, but, um, Benatar, the philosopher who talks about, he's, he's very, he's, you might say he's extreme, he's antinatalist, but he talks about the relationship, um, you know, between parent and child and what it means to actually have children and what that means for, you know, creating, um, you know, an entire other existence and, and that sort of thing. And some of it probably definitely got to a little, you know, down a spiral, but um, I think, their relationship evolved the most just in trying to pin down what it felt like concretely. Because, you know, on the one hand, it's easy to make it sort of like a, a very tropey fairy tale style um, relationship where, you know, they, there's friction, but you, you know, it's really not specified and that sort of thing. Like I really wanted to make it feel like it was rooted in, in real emotions between the two of them. Yeah, I definitely would say that when it came to more so on Dr. Ken's side than uh, mm -hmm. Theo's, of course, that you really got a sense of this conflicting uh, uh, both fear of her creation and uh, uh, you could argue even too that she kind of had this, this self-praise of it, but more than anything, it was this just and, you know, there's always that saying, you know, uh, I'm not angry with you, I'm disappointed, yeah. but I felt like I got a lot of that vibe from Dr. Kent when she would speak about uh, Theo, though I, I would say that it was more of a disappointment in herself I, I kind of picked up on when I was reading uh, her uh, reflections on, on Theo. Um, then in talking about the Theo and... Um, Dr. Kent relationship, there's, from Dr. Kent, there's a lot of uh, ruminating on the idea of why we do the things that we do that we're capable of in this 
uh, this need to, you know, quote unquote, accelerate where we are, uh, because just because we can. Um, and this, as it happens in Act One, I don't feel like it's too much of a spoiler, but uh, one of Theo's first uh, tricks that's that's kind of discussed is him changing uh, traffic lights all into like a, a green go scenario. So it kind of made me zero in on this theme of uh, us being unable to to stop our momentum forward. Uh, would you say that's something while you were writing that you were kind of cognizant of as far as um, how these characters operated in the world, uh, uh, like such as uh, more so, I guess, specifically Theo, um, and Dr. Kent and also Adler, uh, and then another character uh, that I felt was diametrically, diametrically uh, sorry, I'm trying to say big words I can't say out loud, I've only read, but yeah, opposed to uh, their acceleration that I don't want to spoil, but yeah, mm-hmm. um, I guess, yeah, my question would be, was that something that I guess, is that something that you're you're concerned with? Is that something that was inter- like something interesting to explore to you? Yeah, I mean, um, it's funny because I, I feel like it goes back sort of to like the basics of, of writing, as you know, is like, well, what's what's the motivation? Why are people, you know, doing these things we do? And, you know, I asked like, okay, like, well, why would they do this? What, what reasons would they have to do this? Why would they spend money and time on this? And um, it was interesting because I really, you know, deeply thought about, you know, people out in the world who are doing this. Why um, is this something that they want to do? And I had watched um, this documentary. I don't know if it's still out available on Netflix or what have you, but um, called Particle Fever, which was about the creation of the Large Hadron Collider in um, Switzerland. And it was just, you know, I would hear these scientists talk about this thing that cost, you know, like billions of dollars, took, you know, decades and decades, and in some cases, people's entire lives to to create, you know, all for the purposes of studying something which may or may not be there, Um, you know, and the consequences of it being there really don't affect, you know, me going to the grocery store and, and, and getting milk, but to them, it was, you know, their entire, you know, they saw it as, something so much bigger than themselves. And, you know, I'm sure for every individual person that's rooted in different things. Um, But I was just, you know, I would basically listen to these scientists and these people who are really trying to push, you know, for the purposes of progress and just try to like hone in on, you know, what is it that drives people to do those sorts of things. And I think a lot of um, the, the journal entries from Dr. Kent throughout are, you know, my ruminating through her on on these topics and that sort of thing. Um, but I do think it's really fascinating, you know, the way we go from, you know, inventing the wheel to creating chariots and wagons to cars to to trains to planes to shuttles to trying, okay, now we're trying to get to Mars and farther. And it's just, it's so interesting because, um, you know, I, I, it's like searching for an edge and, and not finding it, I guess. And, you know, the question is, well, why, you know, <laughs> what are you getting out of this when, you know, every day you wake up, whether or not there's life on other planets or that sort of thing doesn't really affect, you know, me throwing on like a, you know, a scream marathon or something. Right. Um, but um, it was, it's, it, you know, and it's an answer that, you know, I don't think the book really comes to. I think different people have different takes on it and what progress means, but it definitely was a, an interesting topic that was you know, swimming around in my head. Yeah, and I mean, I guess part of the reason that we can't find the edge is because we all know the earth's flat and you can't yeah. find the edge on a perfect circle. <laughs> that, that, um, was, that was the, the core of the book. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but no, that's one, I, I would say that like that idea of progress for progress sake is, um prevalent but and also more importantly the the dangers with that uh are very prevalent throughout the book uh which i I very much appreciated and enjoyed um i I guess one of the other questions i would have uh surrounding just the the realities that we get to kind of experience 
um, you kind of, when it comes to like the writing of this, I, I noticed that there's a few different genres at play in the book. Uh, for instance, um, specifically focusing on certain acts or over others, uh, you have more of like the sci-fi, uh, more hard sci-fi, I would say with uh, uh, Adler and what's happening in his uh, timeline. Then you also have, uh, I would say uh, with, Laura, uh, a more uh, life serial kind of vibe. Uh, and then also you have, uh, which still is within Laura's uh, focus, uh, a bit of a mystery regarding uh, one of the characters uh, that I don't want to kind of give away why a mystery occurs. Um, but when it came to kind of balancing the different genres and also the more introspective chapters versus the ones that were more um, focused on like development of the the central plot for the piece. Um, what kind of inspired you to to make that kind of a uh, uh, choice to to both blend but but keep these different themes and and genres. Uh, separated from one another in telling this story? Um, it's interesting because I would say that the the first that kind of actually came to mind was um, Laura's story and, you know, everything that happens there. Um, and basically I wanted to have that be, it's it's sort of, it's, only, it's pretty self-contained, um, you know, until it starts to, to mesh and cross with the other stories. Um, but I definitely was aiming for that to be something more self-contained while these were things that felt like they were happening on the periphery around it um, until they do eventually uh, come together. And it's, you know, it's interesting because the story of one somewhat solves or, or illuminates a bit um, what's going on in the other. Um, so it's interesting because I feel like for at least the portion of the book, it almost feels like two completely separate, <laughs> separate stories. And I actually, one of the, um, a friend who was a very, very early reader on this um, was saying she felt even like the first chapter itself felt like a, um, just a short story and it's, you know, a day in the life sort of deal. Um, so yeah, I think it definitely sprang from, this is an idea I have and building around sort of um, that as a self-contained thing for the most part. Box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, boxes and boxes, everyone's in, a, in boxes. But um, yeah, um, and it's interesting because it's, you know, you're never sure what is gonna land in terms of like mystery and that sort of thing. You're never sure how much you're, you're tipping your, uh, is it hat or hand? I can never tip in something. You know, that, yeah. <laughs> time. To, uh, to the reader, because, you know, you know, you know, what's going on. And in cases like that, a lot of the times you're writing from the back forward to try and make, um, you know, to, to layer it enough to, to hide it and that sort of thing. Um, but it's funny because I, I guess I never really thought of, um, the Laura aspects as a mystery, which is funny because, you know, you read the, the chapters where it's, you know, these things start to pick up and happen. And um, it's definitely very, you know, purposefully uh, mysterious and odd. Um, but to me, it, it read as like a sort of unraveling of control, or at least that's what I was um, feeling as I was writing it uh, and what I was trying to, to get across. Um, but I guess that in and of itself is um, part of mystery writing as well. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that uh, the, the loss of unraveling of control, especially after reading the entirety of it, you get more of the sense as to, to the, I guess the, what's happening in the background of that of those chapters uh which i yeah i'm looking forward to revisiting it because now knowing what i do i feel like certain aspects of it will be uh received differently which is always a hard thing to do so congrats on just having like you know multiple interpretations on a read so that's pretty awesome um 
so I guess moving forward to characterization, uh, when it comes to your wonderful plethora of, of uh, supporting characters that you have in here, uh, such as Charlie and Wilson, um, Gray and uh, a few others. Um, what was, I guess, uh, when you're when you're doing your supporting characters, do you kind of build them around uh, like actual individuals more so, like some authors do, or are you kind of uh, like because each of them served a purpose? Though I, I would say in your your novel they were uh, more specifically important to your your protagonist. Uh, so would you say that it was more of like, you know, piecing together from people around you or uh, something different? Um, a couple of them definitely were, one in particular definitely was like fully very much based on a friend. Um, and it's uh, one of the characters in uh, Laura's story, which, I, you know, I feel like for, you know, that makes sense um, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of things. but. Um, yeah, no, there was definitely at least one character who was very much, you know, and a lot of Laura's stuff is based on, um, like when I first started writing this, I was uh, living in Toronto, working in a pizza shop and that sort oh, of thing. Awesome. Okay. So, you know, a lot of that was very just plucked and, um, you know, put on the paper. Um, but, you know, a lot of the other characters, I think just sort of molded not necessarily from folks I know but like spending so much time in my in my um pop culture consumption watching things with like really powerful ensemble casts like Avatar like um nice. Lord of the Rings like Star Wars where you have these characters where you know a lot of times people's favorite character isn't the protagonist um and oftentimes they even make the protagonist seem like almost you know, a boring person because you've got these great um, personalities around them and they get to go on their, you know, their own sort of arcs and that sort of thing. So I was really trying to emulate those things that I was, that I was watching and, and intaking, I think, because I was always just like, yeah, I love, you know, all these characters that surround these people. And I love, you know, feeling, you know, some kind of way, like watching somebody die on Buffy and that sort of thing. Um, and just, you know, feeling like I wanted to create um, a, a world of, of real people who you would care about. Um, oh, and I definitely think that, you know, like Adler's not my favorite character, um, but. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, he was very understandable. Uh, but yeah, as far as likable, there was a bit of a balance on that mm -hmm. uh, with as far as like how much you wanted to you like I always wanted to root for him which is the important part but as far as like uh, agreeing with him sometimes mm -hmm. like I would say there was points where I, I don't know maybe maybe it makes me look a little sociopathic that I would feel like man he's being a little rough on uh on Theo here yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's you know and that's what I was going for and like what you said earlier about like so I'm, I'm not mad at you I'm just disappointed like yeah you know I wanted to to write this person who I would, you know at times I really didn't even like um and you know the challenge there was then like these characters who had to be more important than like well we care about them because Adler cares about them when it's like half the time you know you don't you know you you don't even really care about Adler but you know on their own you you like them and you care about them and you know they kind of got dragged into this and um you know we can at least root for you know, all the people around him who um, have their own lives and their own worlds that they're doing, but also just like, you know, really want this guy to to get it together. Right. Oh, no, no. I, I totally agree. I like that they all seem to be pushing for him or pushing him uh, more directly, uh, except for, I would say, um, and again, I'm horrible with character names sometimes. Um, uh, most of them I, I remember, but there's the not Professor Kent, but uh, the other professor that. Oh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the one that was more of the, I would say, I guess, kind of antagonist, but he was more mm -hmm. of like just like an antagonistic force uh, versus our greater antagonist who actually had the power. Um, and sorry, I was, I went off on a tangent there for a moment. I was going <laughs> somewhere, but 
um, I need to rewrite my code or something. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I, I would say that I, I liked that each of them had their own way of um, interacting with Adler and kind of pushing him in their own ways um, and challenging him, which I, I really enjoy from supporting characters instead of just being there to, to you know, uh, be hype men all around for the, your protagonist. Um, when it comes to uh, the idea of like altering like like the I guess the simulation theory um, mm -hmm. would it like I don't know it's, at points I would I would wonder about Adler's situation like man I'm, like is he in a simulation am I in a simulation is everybody in a simulation um, but that's the scary thing about that theory is that you know the whole point of it is you don't know um, how much of your world is real um, were there any ideas of uh, playing with uh, Adler's kind of perspective in the book? Uh, like, as far as, uh, like, were you always sold on on his world is the real world, our world, um, in the in the writing of it? Yeah, I feel. Um, I mean, in my mind, it it is the real world, but also, who knows what you know, the real world even is, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, but the bringing in of, because, you know, Adler's starting to, like, lose a little sleep over that possibility is kind of what leads to sort of the um, act one shift that happens in the mistake he makes. Um, and that's actually, like, a um, uh, something, you know, I found in my research was a real theory about um, how an artificial intelligence might, um, you know, mess around with a human operator who is, um, you know, monitoring them or, or testing them or doing, you know, whatever sort of, um, you know, work on yes. them. They, <laughs> yeah, they, that was, um, I think it, I called a, I can never say his name right. It's like Yudovsky, Yudovsky, um, you know, this theory that like, because he basically ran tests where he would have somebody would play being an artificial intelligence and somebody would play being a human and they would talk and every time the artificial intelligence won convincing the human to let them out of the box oh, yeah. and one of the methods believed to have been utilized was like okay if you could trick a human or convince a human into thinking that this was the case um, you know and the only way to be free or the only way to find out is to do these things you know if I'm in a box and I'm, you know, in an artificial world, what's to say you're not in a, in a box in an artificial world with somebody else pressing buttons for you? Um, so I think it, bringing that in came from a point of like, um, just looking at like, you know, the, the trajectory of Adler's plot and where he might be, you know, his brain might be going, but then also like, you know, it, it's entirely possible if this was true for a couple different characters, then it might be true for more characters and it might be true for you or me. I, we right, yeah. probably will never know. I um, mean, you know, I don't know about you, but murder hornets, pandemic, all mm -hmm. of this sounds legit real world to me. So yeah. No. <laughs> But no, I mean, that, that that was totally a fear. Like, I was just like, oh, this is a big Black Mirror episode I meant after I read your book. I was like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. So um, it, it's interesting, though, because, like, in your work, you, you do focus on some topics that are very, um, you know, difficult to, to write about, even without, uh, like, uh, especially, out, like, outside, but even more so with, uh, more fantastic elements of like sci-fi like um, when you were approaching um, ideas of uh, like uh, suicide things of that nature um, that was like it was very uh, skillful to that you were able to kind of balance the the story the plot but also you know discuss these things in a very uh I want to say uh, leveled way without without being, um, I guess uh, I'm trying to think of the word I'm looking for without uh, indulging or without um, 
uh, really coming to any conclusions on the rights or wrongs, things of that nature. Um, and also when it came to like the relationships more romantically, such as like Charlie and Adler, I, I really enjoyed their uh, interactions and their, I guess, finding the the path that I felt like in, by the end, well, never mind, I won't go that far, but um, <laughs> I'm like by the end of the book so you know make sure to check out everybody <laughs> but um uh i was like when it came to the the interactions it felt so so honest and so real when it uh, as far as like their uh ultimate decisions and uh the navigation of the the relationship uh and the ownership of it uh i, I would say that uh when it came to Adler, of course, I, I was kind of less pleased with some of his actions, though they felt real, the pettiness of, of his movements, etc. Um, I was going somewhere as far as the question there, but I was totally just kind of involved in like, oh, yeah, but that was a really good relationship that I liked. So I, I guess I could just end as we're at the almost 15 minute mark to open it up for questions. But I guess that's just more common than that. I really loved that relationship and appreciated that writing. Um, so I guess I wanna take a moment to check in with our participants who thank you again for coming to this uh, event and discussion uh, on Melanie's work uh, for any questions you might have, um, which we can definitely take in the chat uh, and yeah. And I'll give it like a minute or two to see if anybody has anything. <clears throat> this is the fun part where we just stare. At the oh, yeah. Okay, from Abby Cover, uh, we have what was your favorite bit of AI you learned? uh like ai information um i assume um i think it was learning exactly and i say learning exactly as if i understand any of this but learning from a very very high level um how these things actually work in um you know our real life day to day i mean like you mentioned um it's i try to do a little bit of hard science fiction at the beginning you know, I was conscientious of it um, being grounded in reality, even though this is, you know, something that probably won't happen, hopefully never in our lifetimes, <laughs> right. um, but strong. is in a lot of ways the goal of um, things we're, we're doing. But just learning, um, you know, what actually the processes are that go into um, creating what we know as artificial intelligence and the various things that these algorithms are able to do um you know and things like um when you are doing captures you know really what we're doing is training where they're gathering data to train algorithm when they're asking you to identify bikes you know when you like do stuff and they're like pick the bikes and you have to pick the images with bikes that information goes to something that is learning how to identify bikes or identify what have you um for you know whatever purpose um I'm so sure it's just, legit fine not yeah. well and that's thing. the other thing too is just learning a lot of the problems that go into this and I listen to a lot of um uh data scientists and um engineers um it, who were talking about essentially what they call like fairness in AI and, you know, the need for more women, more people of color um, to, you know, so we don't have issues like I referenced in here, the Uber self-driving cars um, and that sort of thing. And just learning how, you know, very real the stakes are with things that seem, you know, on the internet, probably so silly um, when you come across like, oh yeah, this, this, you can chat to this AI and it'll talk to you about, you know, like, Doctor Who or, you know, what have you, um, you know, the things that people are making are real things and um, they're working on them now. And, um, you know, one day we might go from something that can play chess better than any other human to, um, you know, something a lot more close to, to you or me. Um, so I think it was just interesting diving into there and getting at least 
a slightly like six inches beneath the surface of the top level understanding of uh, all of it. Yeah, no, and I gotta say, like when it came to some of like your more, uh, even those ideas that weren't so necessarily tied to AI, I found very like illuminating, like how the for like how virus like some viruses work when it came to like the execution file part like uh i feel like i should have known that because i'm a nerd but i lose some some nerd cred there um and also just how theo's ultimate uh objective was interesting to me as far as how it was very um relatable uh but i guess that's kind of the point of ai that's achieved a, a level of of uh completion is that it should be almost um you know imperceivable from mm -hmm. an actual human um but yeah no that was thank you uh abby for that awesome question um uh do we have any other questions at all we can totally just keep talking too if, if we don't get any more so i'll give it like one minute see if anybody else has another one Just imagine the Jeopardy music going through. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, a thing. I've gone into Zooms before where people are playing like waiting room music. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a little weird. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I used to, because I also do um, work with like a, uh, a nonprofit, like a uh, writing group, or not writing group, uh, literary mag. And uh, yeah, sometimes they'll just have some chill hot paint playing when we enter the room and I'm like, oh yeah, this is nice. <laughs> oh, awesome, Abby, thank you again for another question. And we have, would you be pleased or disappointed or neither if you found out you were an AI? Westworld time. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because I've thought about this, um, obviously, and all this thing, kind of things that keep you up at night. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think uh, on the one hand, it uh, might be nice to feel like there is some sort of uh, order to the universe if there are artificial intelligences uh, running around and that sort of thing. Um, on the other hand, it might be incredibly uh, frightening to perceive the nature of the universe in that way. But um, I don't know. I think it would be it would be kind of cool, maybe, if that if I if that happened. But then I think about like all the things that like uh like oh my gosh, people were people watching me when I did this and when I did that, and did somebody see that <laughs> and that sort of thing. Um, but I think I would be eh, maybe a little bit of neither, maybe a little bit of both. Yeah, no, I totally dig that. I would say that from your book that there's different um perspectives of AI. And I would say that I would definitely be more pleased with one versus the other. Um, and that's all I can really say about that without yeah. any kind of, but um, but yeah, no, I, I would say that I, I would agree with that. And also um, when it comes to just the cool factor of like being able to like, you know, say, hey, we did that. But mm -hmm. as addressed in your book, doing that just for that sake might have problems of its own. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, thank you for that awesome question, Abby. Um, yeah, when it comes to uh, the, the choice of bouncing around with uh, the perspectives in your novel and uh, balancing out, I guess, how much you wanted to give us of Laura's perspective and Theo's and also uh, Adler's. Um, I, I feel like almost like there's no real particular protagonist in this book because when I was reading it, there would be times where it just didn't, I don't know, I would sometimes like see myself like flipping my choice on, am I like, reading a Adler chapter in a, in a Laura book, or am I reading a Laura chapter in an Adler book? Uh, so I guess, I don't know if you have a, a, a choice, but would you say that there is like a, a more intended protagonist uh, 
when like when you were writing it? Um, I mean, Laura definitely came first. Um, and I think, you know, I relate to her a little bit more if, you know, not just because I, I gave a lot of, you know, the aspects of, of my life at that time to her character, but also just the general, I mean, they both have kind of like different um, sort of like experiences with like millennial dread and burnout and that sort of thing that I feel both um, feel very real and present to me. Um, but I think particularly with how uh, Laura's, you know, story plays out and, and what's going on with her, you know, it felt like, um, you know, being able to put a lot of like very visceral frustrations that I had into a context, um, you know, and it almost feels like, you know, maybe kind of, um, the benefit people get from mythology, mythologizing certain things, you know, like I basically was able to, to with her mythologize um, very, you know, things that I found really frustrating in my life. Um, and I think I was closer to that than I was to Adler, but Adler obviously became a huge part of the book. Um, and so did a lot of, uh, you know, the people within his world. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's tough. Like, I don't, I don't know if I could, I could pick one because either story is two very different um, stories. And, you know, by the time they're so, by the time you get to the middle to the end, they're so intertwined that, um, you know, I feel like if I wrote a version where it was just looking at one or just looking at the other, you'd, you'd definitely lose something. Yeah, no, I and mean, that's true because they they work both in tandem with one another, but also uh, part of it is them like the the the, per, the perspectives kind of are dependent on being so separate, um, which I think kind of deals with one of the themes of connectivity and loneliness that you kind of uh, explore throughout, which I, I dug a lot as far as how you address this, but um also just treated it with such nuance that i really appreciate it um so um as we are now at our five minute mark i just want to keep checking in with our audience um and see if there was any other questions uh before i keep rattling on <laughs> <laughs> Well, and again, thank you everyone for uh, joining this discussion and just being a part of this uh, talk about Melanie's awesome book, uh, which I will say is available on audiobook as well as paperback from Lanternfish Press, who also published uh, my own work. So we are uh, publishing House Siblings. And yours right here. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun to like, or weird yeah. when you see somebody else show you, like, oh, that's me. <laughs> but yeah, no, and um, if we don't have any other uh, questions today, I just want to say thank you to uh, Toadstool Bookshop uh, for hosting our discussion. Um, and also that both, I as someone who has both read the uh, audio and physical copies. I gotta say both of them are very enjoyable in different ways. Um, and what was that like for you, by the way, that experience of like first hearing the, because uh, have you listened to the audiobook for your novel? I actually haven't listened to it yet. Oh, yeah, I have heard, it's funny because my mom listens to it because she, mm -hmm. she does better on audio. And she, she would say to me, she's like, yeah, I can really hear your voice. Cause I, I understand that they have a, um, the the narrator's a woman yeah um 
And she's like, yeah, I feel like I can really hear your, so I'd, I'd be interested to definitely uh, listen to somebody else's interpretation of, of reading it, because I don't think I'm a very good reader of my own work, but I feel like it was a thing in workshops when other people would read, you know, work, it's like, oh, wow, that sounds so much better elevated in your style of, right. um, yeah, of reading. <laughs> so I, I'm pretty excited to, to give it a listen. Awesome. Yeah, no, it was uh, the the narrator uh, does an awesome job uh, of reading your work uh, as well as like a balance of multiple voices. I think you'll get a kick out of how they did uh, Theo of uh, okay. anyone else. That was really fun. I'm excited. <laughs> uh, um, but speaking on that, that is now available uh, pretty much wherever you get audiobooks um, and also on lanternfrischpress.com. Uh, they have some wonderful titles coming up. Uh, such as Melanie's, which was just released this month, uh, which I think was just in time um, with the spooky season, um, mostly because black cats and, and fun with yeah. that. <laughs> the cat has been a the cat on the cover has been a real a real hit with people. Oh, good, yeah. No, I really like sandpaper. gravitated towards him. <laughs> yeah, no, sandpaper was one of the cooler literary cats I've come yeah. across. <laughs> But no, but thank you again. And as we are reaching time, uh, I just want to say that I appreciate everyone for attending. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Melanie. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, it was it was really um, a privilege to have you guys. And I don't know if everyone um, you know realizes how much energy it takes to really engage. Um, and to really participate in, in the way that you guys did today um, and, you yeah. know, to really relate to another author. Um, and, you know, I, I really appreciate that about, about you guys. And so, um, and thank you so much for all of you who attended in the moment and for all of you who will watch this later. Um, and um, yeah, I just want to say thank you. And we look forward to reading your your book and um and hearing from you again so thank you so much thank you